then here the same thing will happen. You draw the line to the center, and then they, they draw something like this. Now you are asked what happens to it after it's enlarged in the top bounds. So let's try and work out some of the geometry for one bound so that we understand the problem a little bit. And in particular, what I'm going to do is slope is A divided by B. Yeah? Sorry? Rise over run. Sounds good. So, uh, so uh, it's a rise to the numerator or the denominator? The rise. All these good things are happening. So the geometry starts to starts to become somewhat clear here. Now, uh, what you'll see is that the first chord gets bisected by this, and and it has a certain length. The next chord will also have the same length. Why is that? That's right, it, it has the same angle with, with, these, with the center, and uh, uh, which, means that the, which means that the angle here is also going to be uh, the same as the angle that you had previously. Let me see if this makes sense. So this is the first angle because you had, you it here and it hit this point. Right? Then you, uh, your angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So these two angles are the same. And it's also equal to this angle here. It's also equal to this angle here. So all of these angles are exactly the same. Uh, which also means that that the, that the length of the chord is going to stay the same because the angle subtended at the center cannot be different. So you can see here that this triangle here, let me call this, uh, let's call this A1, A2, and center is O. If I take this triangle A1, A2, O, it looks, it has to be identical to A2, A3, O. And therefore, the chord lengths must be the same. Okay. So these are, this is one important thing that we need to realize. What else? Uh, we know that these angles are the same. And if you drop a perpendicular to the chord, uh, so if you drop a perpendicular to the chord, it could be something like this. So here is one angle, here is another angle. Those two angles are the same as this angle and this angle because those triangles are the same. So you're just bisecting that triangle, right? You're bisecting this angle here that's subtended in the middle. So therefore, those angles have, have to be the same because they're half of, of whatever angle you have there in the center, right? So 
so a lot of the uh, triangles start to look similar. Now we are going to try and write something down. Let's call, uh, yeah, I have too many things drawn here, so I need to use a different color. Yeah, let me use black here. So I'm going to call this angle as, let's say, theta. So this is theta, so is this. And then when it reflects, the angle with the, uh, with this, with the bisector is again theta, and so is this. So all these angles are thetas, right? Uh, also, the angle that you get at the, at the place where it, let's call this as alpha. All of these are going to be alpha, right? because every triangle is, 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 is similar. So this here is alpha, this is alpha, and so on, which means this here is alpha, right? I know it's getting a little messy, but soon it'll start to become clear. So here's what I'm gonna say. What is the length of this chord? Remember the radius is one, Right, so we know one of these distances. So uh, the radius r is equal to one. So if this is one and this angle is alpha, what is that? Let me draw that picture again here. It looks something like this. This is one, this is alpha, and this here is a right angle. Right? Because this was a perpendicular drop to it. This is a perpendicular drop here, right? So what is this length? Uh, cosine of, it's actually just cosine of alpha, not one over cosine alpha, right? Because cosine of alpha is this side divided by this. This is the hypotenuse here. Because this is where the right angle is, right? So this length is cosine alpha, and this length is sine alpha, right? Okay, that's great. So the length of the chord is two times cosine alpha. That's telling us something a little bit already, right? Um, by the way, if, if I just went by first principles, I can pretty much figure out what A2 is because it's a distance to, to cosine alpha. If I know alpha, I can figure this out because it's the intersection of that line segment with, with the circle. So theoretically, I can figure this out, but that's not how you want to do it. Okay? What's next? There's also another angle here, and that's this theta. So if I use theta, what is the, what is the length of, of this guy here? Remember, this is theta. So what's this, this, this length now? Remember, theta is just pi over two minus alpha, right? So it's going to be sine of theta. So this is really same as sine of theta. This is same as cosine of theta, right? All this is, is seems reasonable. So what it means is that if I can figure out either alpha or theta or any of these darned angles, I can pretty much figure out where I'm going to hit the next one. And then where's the next one? And where's the next one? It, it all can happen pretty easily. The problem is that M can be very, very large. And that, so that's a different problem. All we are trying to do is to try and understand this. Now there is one more thing that comes in. We have to bring in A and B somehow. And if I use this angle alpha here, then you see that there is another triangle here that goes A, sorry, A1, A2, and a perpendicular drop. And this length here is, is A times M. This length here is B times M. And this angle here is alpha. So what is, how can you write alpha in terms of A and B now? You know that you want, uh, you want to just take these two things into account, and that would be tan of alpha, right? So tangent of alpha is AM divided by BM, and M will cancel out. So we don't really care about M, it's some, some number, right? 
So now we have brought it down to something we already know. So that means given A and B, I can figure out alpha pretty easily. And once I know alpha, I know what theta is. Once I know what theta is, I can theoretically figure out where, where it's going to bounce. But as I said before, because n is very, very large, this is a problem. This doesn't necessarily work out for us. Is this clear? And maybe this much you already figured out. Uh, but now you have, to, you have to work hard in terms of figuring out. Uh, you have to write down. So by the way, uh, if tan of alpha is, is a over b, can I write theta? I can write tan of theta to be equal to b over a. because it's uh, tan of alpha is sine divided by cosine, which is the same as cosine divided by sine for theta, and so this is easy. So that means I can figure out theta reasonably easily, and theoretically I can, I can follow my nose and figure out where, where it hits. Now in order to figure out uh, where it's gonna hit after a large number of, of these bounces, I have to do this modular arithmetic. And that's where some of the challenges are. Next. Okay. Now, let's do one more thing. If I gave you, so uh, we know that the first hit was here. Sorry, uh, this is where you started, A1. At A1, the polar angles are easy to figure out. The polar angles are what? Polar angle, rather, is what? If, I, if I'm standing here at the origin, and if this is my zero direction, then A1 is going to be at, at polar angle pi, right? Because the, the entire circle is two pi, right? So I could either call it pi or minus pi. It doesn't matter. It's the same point. So I'm starting at polar angle pi. After one bounce, my polar angle is going to be, I can add this theta and I can add another theta. What's it going to be? So let's call the first angle as pi. What do you think the second angle is going to be? What's the polar coordinate, uh, sorry, polar angle of A2? Pi minus two theta, right? And what about ga lambda three? That's right, so it should be pi minus four theta, and so on. So after n bounces, I can pretty much figure out it's gonna be pi minus n times two, th two n theta. So if I know theta, this is not so hard to figure out. Once I know this angle, can I find out the coordinates of that point? So now I have a circle. This is my origin. I'm looking at some strange point that has a polar angle of something. Let's call it lambda. What are the coordinates of this point? By the way, the radius is one. So the polar, so the, the uh, Cartesian coordinates of this point are? Well, the x, x drop will tell you how much the x coordinate is, and the y drop will tell you how much the y coordinate is, right? Pretty straightforward, because this is the origin. So what are the coordinates? Right, so it's going to be cosine lambda sine lambda, right? So that means all I have to do is to figure out this angle, and then I'm done, more or less. Is that clear? Yeah. So the two things all of two things have one common. Oh, boop, boop, yeah. Well, yeah, it might be. So yeah, uh, you think two n is right? Lambda 2 gives me 
gives me two, lambda three gives me four. So, so I think he may be right. It should be two n minus two. But isn't lambda two the one time? Like ah, yeah, that way, yeah, sure, you're right. So this is, yeah, you're right. This is where the first bounce is. This is oh where the, so it, it all depends on what they're asking. Is, so you can, you can figure that out. I think you have the general idea here, right? You don't have to go through all these steps in order to figure this out. It's just a matter of, uh, of multiplying and adding, right? And then once you've done this, finding the actual coordinate is, is also child's play. So really, the, the problem seems to be finding theta and then, and then taking care of some more details. So I'm gonna stop with this problem here and let you nail down some of the details and we can talk next time again. Fine? Yeah, at least the way I've written here, this should be, uh, this should be plus one here. Yeah. Sorry? I didn't get, I get, I did get to the part You got this, this far? Yeah. And it did work? I was comparing based off of the example they gave us, so basically making my math really true. Okay. Oh, so you do have a formula? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I've been working on it, trying to see, okay. But I, but I got the because the actual programming part should just be five lines, right? <laughs> More or less. Oh, well, no, you have to take care of these large numbers. Yeah, okay. Although, the reason this is a unique term is I wanted to, if you can condense it down to Yeah. Keep it going in a circle? Yeah. Well, let us know when, when, your, when your code gets accepted. Any, anyone else try this already? No? All right, shall we move on to something else? Yeah, I wanted to talk about diagonals. How many of you tried this already or thought about it? Nobody solved it yet, right? Nobody has a solution that, that got accepted, no? Okay. All right, let's, let's see what we can do with this. Uh, I may ha actually have slides on it. Anyone wants to summarize the problem for me? For the class? So you get a grid and each dot in this grid Yeah. But then you'll talk some, some constraints, so if I have the vector in this grid, you have a number, and that number represents how many grids you need to be part of that number. Right. And there's a second condition that you can't allow cycles. Yeah, each of those grids, yeah. Right, that's a little annoying uh, condition there, uh, which causes some, some, it'll cause you some headaches. Uh, all right, so let's take a look here. So the input is a, is a square grid of size n, so n by n. Uh, actually, there are n plus one rows and columns just because uh, it's the number of cells that we are talking about here. So there are n cells horizontally and vertically, right? And then uh, you're told that the, at, at some of these intersections, you may be given a number. That number is supposed to indicate how many diagonals meet there. If a number is given, uh, the, the, you have to have precisely that number of diagonals meet there. And if a number is not given, who cares? You can do whatever you want, right? And finally, you don't want to allow any loops in the, in the set of diagonals that you end up drawing, right? Uh, and you want us output the actual diagonals. You, you need to figure out what it is that you're doing. Uh, that satisfies the above constraints. And the, the, uh, 
the good news here is that the n is very small. Right? So this should tell you something pretty immediately. When n is this small and the problem looks non-trivial, it means you're doing some exponential stuff with n. right? Otherwise, they're not going to give you n of 8. There's just no way they'll, they'll do that. Right? So this is, uh, this is a big clue for you that you need to make use of uh, very well. So somewhere there's either going to be a factorial or an exponent or something along those lines where you're doing uh, some big combinatorial search. So that's useful to know right away as you get this idea that there is some combinatorial things going on here, and I need to watch out for it. Okay. Okay. So so that's clue number one. Then here's the example that they gave in the in the paper. You, you are given a grid like this. There are a few numbers scattered around at these intersections. And your job is to satisfy those constraints that are imposed by these numbers by setting your diagonals either going this way or this way. So in this case, there's exactly one diagonal that meets here. Here there are three diagonals that meet. Here there's only one. Here there's only one. Here there's one, and you can see everywhere else it, it's satisfied, and, and then where it's not written, you can do whatever the heck you want. Okay. So question is, uh, well, remember, the output is you need to figure out exactly how you're going to set the gates, sorry, the diagonals. And so this diagonal can either go like so or like so, and your job is to figure out which way it goes. And you have to do this for every diagonal. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, that's right. So, in fact, my next slide will tell you about this naive approach, and it's worthwhile to think about the naive approach so that you know what your baseline is. And, and I've said this before, and you definitely should follow that. So the naive approach is each diagonal has a binary state, either going up or going down. So that's like a 0, 1 kind of thing, and you should be able to try every possible combination theoretically. And the reason that doesn't work is exactly what you just said, because there are n squared diagonals to set. n squared can be up to 64. 2 to the 64 is, uh, uh, sorry, 2 to the 256 is not something you want to play with, right? That's too large a number, forget it. Um, sorry, so it's not 64, it's 256, right? Because n is 8. So what do we do? So this, whole, this thing doesn't work. This approach is not going to work. You can't go and do exhaustive uh, brute force approach. So where do you make things better? Sorry, where does the come from? That's n is 8. So there are n squared. Uh, you just said there are n squared yeah, diagonals. 8 squared is, oh, 8 squared is 64. You're right. So it's not 2. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know what I was thinking. So it's 2 to the 64. 2 to the 64 is bad enough. It's bad news. You don't want to be anywhere near that anyways, right? 2 to the 64, by the way, is yeah, roughly how, how much? So easy way to think about this is 2 to the 10 is about 1,000. Okay. So this is 2 to the 10 times 6. So it's going to be... 6 times 3, that's about two fo 1 followed by 18 zeros. So it's about 10 to the 18, somewhere there. The 18. Yeah. So it's 1 followed by, so it's 10 to the power 18, roughly. A little bit higher than that. Yeah, but it's, it's a good idea to do this in your head. You don't need to write this down. Uh, so. 2 to the, uh, sorry, uh, 2 to the 10 is 1024. So just think of that as 1,000. So that's 1 followed by three zeros. You're doing 64, so that's 10 to the, sorry, 2 to the 10 to, the, to another 6. So you're, you're already somewhere in the range of 
of 10 cubed to the 6. So that's 10 to the 18. So you, you'll know where you are roughly, and that's already way too large. You don't want to mess with this. Okay. So the question is, what next? Where do I go from here? And the the clue the clue is uh, what's the approach you want to you want to take? Any thoughts? You guys already know this. No. Okay. Uh, so the approach you want to take is is DP, is dynamic programming. And let's see how we're going to apply dynamic programming. Uh, dynamic programming already makes people uncomfortable, so, uh, uh, we, but we have a systematic way of thinking about this, and it's worthwhile to try and apply those things. If you, if you attended my lectures in the past, that'll help you. But here I'm going to, uh, to jump a little bit and, and not go step by step that I've done in class. So what do I do? How do I take this? Well, what I'm going to do is the following. I am, I am going to uh, try, uh, I'm going to think of different possible combinations uh, in, in entire columns of the grid. So think of this as the setting for, as the possible settings for everything in one of the columns. And think of this as the settings of the diagonals in the adjacent column next to it. So in other words, I am I'm looking at all the columns in the grid. So I have one of these sets for each of the columns in that grid, right? Remember there are at most eight. So there are going to be at most eight of these. And in each of the columns, I'm going to have a, I'm actually building a graph here, even though it doesn't look like a graph. I'm going to build a graph where the different vertices in here are going to correspond to the different choices that I make for that column. Okay, so let's say I'm looking at the third and fourth column. On the third column, I have eight different diagonals. So each of the, each of the entries in here are going to correspond to the different choices that I make. And how many such choices are there for one column? So it's two to the eight at most, right? Because there are, we know that the grid size is at most eight. And I'm going to add two extra vertices and you'll understand the meaning of that in a, in a few minutes. So this, as I said before, consists of vertices, one vertex for every choice, every decision choice for column I. The same thing is for column I plus one, right? And, and then I'm going to throw in some edges between them. Uh, and the edges are going to be going to represent things that are compatible. So I'm going to connect a choice here and a choice here if they are compatible. Now what does that mean? What is compatible here? I guess we look at the diagonals and if they satisfy the, the number. The number constraints, that's right. Remember, uh, if you have two sets of cells, next to each other in column I and column I plus one, in between there are a bunch of constraints that were introduced to you by the numbers that were written there. And those numbers better be satisfied, otherwise I'm not gonna connect those two choices. Okay. And now I built this entire network. Okay, oops, sorry. So, I'm also going to add in some edges going from the start vertex to the first column and from the last column to this, this extra vertex. And then, essentially, I'm gonna do a shortest path from here to here. Or in fact, I'm gonna take, not shortest path, I'm gonna find a path.
from here to here. As long as all the choices are compatible, that path is going to be a valid path, which will tell me exactly what settings I want to pick for each of the columns. OK? So this is a setting that I want to use. And from here, we are going to get to the dynamic programming aspect of it. Did, did this make sense to people? Can I go over it one more time? Yes, Jada. I'm not sure if you meant path from there to there. Sorry? I'm not sure if you meant path. What, what do I mean by a path? Yeah, OK. So, so remember, if I, can, if I can figure out the right choices for everything to the left of this, and if I can take one of these compatible edges, then I'll pick, I'll pick one vertex from here, one vertex from here, one vertex from each column. And remember, each of those vertices corresponds to a setting of all the diagonals, right? So the path that I take, this is just a start one. I'll go to the first column that'll tell me exactly what choices I'm gonna make for column one. The vertex I pick in the second guy will tell me exactly what choices I'm going to make for the second column. And I only pick it if it's compatible with the first one. And I keep doing this. And if I can get it, get to this end, then I know that I have a path. Right? So this is all conceptual. I'm not telling you this is how you're going to solve the problem. But this will help you to think about it next. But are you, are you clear about this? this framework that I'm using here. Questions, Demba? Oh, no, I get it. Um, the only thing is, do you consider uh, the elimination of that was like why can I send the compatible ones right now? Or like, Sorry, say that again? Like you know how one column can only be connected to another column if it's one compatible, right? Even if it's outside of that, it can still be just one number at that corner. Yeah, do you, do you or the cycles. The cycles are an annoying part. I haven't, I haven't quite explained that here. But somehow we have to weave that in. It'll, it'll come. It'll fall into place sooner or later. Okay? But you're right. That is a, that is a detail that I'm not, I'm not telling you here. Uh, but yeah, keep that in mind because uh, by compatible also, I, I mean that it doesn't end up forming a cycle with things on the left. Okay. So I think it can be weaved in, but it's not so straightforward. You're right. Uh, OK, so, so what's next? Uh, right, so, <coughs> so we have to talk about what are the decisions we make for each column, what are the choices we make for each column, and what does it mean for things to be compatible. We already talked about it. So remember, the decision for a column is that I have to make, it, I have to pick a choice for each of the diagonals. And there, are, there may be up to eight of them. For an entire column, I make all the choices. And for each one, I have to decide whether it's up or down. I know I made a mistake here again. This should be 64, not 256. My apologies. Uh, oh no, 2 to the 8 is 256, right? I did get this right. OK, sorry. Yeah. So, so there are 256 choices for each column. right? So I'm going to have a vertex for each of these choices. All right? And then this tells us how to check for compatibility, because what we are going to say is the choice here in column i and the choice here in column i plus 1, they are compatible if it satisfies all the constraints of the numbers in between. We can look at an example, and hopefully it'll start to make sense. Uh, where is that example? Yeah. So if you see here, the first column has these choices where the first three are going down, the, the bottom two are going up. These choices are compatible with the choices here where I have down, up, down, up, up. It's compatible because this two and this three and this one are satisfied perfectly. Okay? 
because this two is, brings in, explains this two, and there are no other links going out. And so therefore, two is satisfied. This three is satisfied because you got one from the left and two from the right from the choices you made. And that one comes from the one going down, and all others you don't care. So therefore, these two sets of choices are compatible, and I would connect them. There may be other choices that are compatible, and I'll connect all those things. OK? And once I do that, uh, I pretty much will be able to solve this problem, except for the cycles part. So what do I do about the cycles? What I'm going to do is to only look at loops or cycles that are formed to the left of your second choice. OK? So if, by adding this, I end up forming a cycle with things on the left, then it would be not allowed. But there, it's not enough just to look at, at, at two things. I also have to worry about, I have to worry about what gets connected. Yeah. Um, I'd have to think about this. I, I don't have the answer now. But maybe you, you guys can think about this and tell me what to do. Yeah? Do you have any thoughts, Demba? Yeah. Yeah, but that depends on which choices you made. You can't try all, all possible choices. Remember, we, we, uh, we're only collecting things that are possible. There may be more than one. There may be lots. Um, so anyways, I, I think that the, uh, it's still not completely solved, but, but this should give you a framework for how to, how to handle it, OK? Questions? Was this a little too quick? Everyone OK with this? Shall we, we can try one of the, the easier examples here. Let's see. They had one with three, right? Let's do this. This is what's given to you. Now, what does my network look like? By the way, how many are you going to have in each in each uh, in each column? Remember, there are there are two possible there are there are three uh, diagonals you have to worry about. So there are two to the three possibilities. That's eight. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could have uh, uh, up up up. Up, up, down, up, down, up, up, down, 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 up, up, down, up, down, 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 up, and down, down, down. 
These are your eight possibilities for column one. You're going to have similar things for column two. All right. And we have to decide how to connect them. There are going to be other columns here as well. And how do we do that? Well, I'm going to pick two of these and see whether they are compatible show you how, how one tests this. So let's say, first of all, uh, even among here, uh, there may be some constraints, but then there are no numbers written here, and so there are no constraints. So all of these are still active and possible, right? Then when you're connecting something over here and something over here, let's say I were to pick, uh, I don't know, this one here and say this one here. What does this look like? This looks like up down, down, sorry, I should draw it there. Uh, so we have up, down, down, so that's up, down, down, and then we have up, up, down. So up, up, down. Wow, we actually, no, we almost got lucky. <laughs> it didn't satisfy this, zero, it should have been uh, that this could not could not be satisfied, but the three is and this one is. Does that make sense? So here the answer would be no. I would not connect these two. Okay. However, if I were to if I were to flip this, then I would have trouble over here. It would become four. Uh, if I were to flip this, I would have trouble here because then I would have two. Anyways, you see what's what's happening that not too many of these possibilities are going to work out for you. So I would figure out which of these can be connected. And remember, I have an extra vertex here. OK. I would have to figure out how, which one, which, I can, which uh, of these possibilities I can connect here. Because there are no constraints, this is connected to each one of these. Right? Only some of these are going to be connected from here to here, from here to here, and so on. And ultimately, I would need to know whether I can get from here to here, which means I have to have a sequence of compatible choices so that I can get to the end. So therefore, if there is a path here, I have a set of compatible choices, and they're all going to work. Otherwise, if such a path does not exist, we know the answer is no. So the next question is, yeah, this idea seems OK, but is it, is it efficient? Right? So let's, let's go through the computations. Let's go through the calculations and figure this out. Are you guys OK with this so far? Yeah? So by the way, you're told something really valuable. You're told that there is exactly one path in, in this. In this uh, uh, there's only one solution. So the great thing is that, uh, uh, for instance, if there is no path that takes you here, you can essentially throw that out and not worry about it for the next step. OK? Uh, so lots of good things can happen as you go along. Uh, if you can't get here from there, you can, uh, in, in, for instance, if this one does not work for whatever reason, then I could just throw this away, throw this right away, and it would be okay. And then when I come to the next step, I don't have to consider all the cases. I can, I have fewer cases to consider, so I could make it more efficient, and so on and so forth. So the graph is going to have, remember there are, there are uh, two to the eight here. That's 256 possible nodes in each of these layers. There are eight such layers. And then I also actually, I have to count 10, not eight. So whatever it is, it's roughly in the range of 2,000, 3,000, right? 
So it's a fairly small number. Did I get that right? Yeah. Why would we multiply times 10 instead of 8? Sorry? Why would we multiply times 10 instead of 8? Uh, because I have to consider the start vertex and the end vertex, and I have to look at edges going from there. You can, you can ignore that one if you want to, uh, but then you would have to account for it in other ways. Yeah? Because you have to look at the uh, compatibility for the leftmost column, it's useful to have that extra vertex. Yeah? Okay. So what, you're, what it's saying is that the number of nodes is not too large, and the number of edges I'm going to get from this is never going to be uh, more than 4 million. And so in the worst case, you're go it's going to be manageable, right? Um, now, uh, as I said before, you can keep track of which nodes are reachable right from the start. If it's not reachable, you can start to drop it even earlier. Uh, and then it's just a reachability question at the end. Are we good? The only thing we haven't figured out is the, is the cycle part, and I, I, I completely forgot about that when, once I got into this part. Um, so time complexity. Yeah, there are n iterations. In each iteration, you are looking at 2 to the n times 2 to the n. So that's like 2 to the 2n. That's still something like 64,000. It's not so bad. And then you're going to do this n times. So you're going to do this eight times. So you're, you're somewhere less than a million, and it's definitely manageable. Are you good? So the time complexity is somewhere in the range of 2 to the 2n times n. How much time do I have? I've got 20 minutes. We have two choices. Either we can try and figure out this thing with the cycles, or we can figure out what to do with, uh, with, the, with the next problem. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, so if I understood, it, understood him right, what he's saying is, go and build this graph completely, and don't just look for a path from here to here, but also uh, as, you, as you look for the path, check if, uh, if, if it forms cycles with the choices you made before that. Is that did, that, did I get this right? No, no, just look for a path, right? And ignore if there is a cycle or not. And if there is a cycle, at the end of it, if you're going to have multiple paths, you're not end up having just one path because you have some wrong answers because they have cycles, right? But once you get to the other end and you know that this is a path, but there may be cycles, just build another path there. Just check if you have a cycle. And it could be done with this 64. Yeah, but that's only after the fact. And what if it fails? Are you going to say that it was never possible? What if you had picked a different choice? You're going to try like all the possible choices. No, no, you're not. Uh, uh, the, you trying to look for reachability doesn't necessarily look for all possible choices. But like what I'm saying is, you look for reachability based on the constraints of the numbers you have that so, are common, right? So the problem with reachability is that there may be multiple ways to reach reach your destination. And you don't want to try each one of them. That's too many. Uh, that's another trap you definitely don't want to fall into. Instead, 
you want to think about it as, uh, you know, the way we think about dynamic programming. By the way, this was, this was very much dynamic programming because in each step you're trying to figure out information based on everything you knew so far, okay? Uh, and you want to use dynamic programming, so you want to say if the cycle uh, ends here, if the cycle only involves things to the left, which choices are going to mess me up? Okay, and that requires a slightly different consideration. It's not not quite. Uh, so I know this has some this information. So the word channel from left to right. Yeah. As soon as we see uh, this corner, we know it's a successive from the cycle. And if it continues on all the way to the right, yeah. We see, let's say, another corner. We know that those two corners they could form a cycle. Well, check this example out. There are lots of corners, and yeah. nothing happened. Because so, so this is a corner. Nothing yeah. happened. Sure. Well, if it's if it's a nice small cycle, that's great. But what if the cycle is all complicated? Goes like that. It's, it doesn't have to be that way. It could go wander around. Uh, it could it could zigzag. It could go it could go like that, like that, and then come back up like this. So th lots of weird things can happen. It's not so straightforward a cycle. And so you really have to keep track of which things will will be connected for which choices. And I don't know if you can keep track of that. That's that's what I'm uh, I'm concerned about. So that's why I'm saying it's not. Sorted out in my head. I'd have to think about it more, but uh, I still think it's it's possible to sort it out. Let's revisit this next time. Yeah, uh, and I will let you guys think about this. I'll bug you over Discord and and make sure you think about this more. Yeah. Okay. All right. I still have fifteen minutes. That's good. Let's talk about hopscotch, yeah? I don't think I have any slides made up for it, so we may have to just, yeah, okay, good. Um, yeah, I have some slides here. We'll take a look. Uh, you remember hopscotch? Uh, it's supposed to be this game where you are, uh, you are, you're supposed to jump to tile one or, an, or any tile that's numbered one then from there to any tile that's number two, and then number three, and so on and so forth, until you get to the highest number, which is some number k, and, and at, that, at that point your game's done. You, you won, or whatever it is that you want to call it. Uh, so the input is a square grid. Again, it's of size n. So it's n by n grid. And each square in the grid has a number. And that number is some number between 1 and k. So k can be pretty large. In fact, k can be all the way up to n squared, because there are n squared possible cells. And then uh, your job is to do hopscotch, uh, always going from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5, and so on, up to k. Uh, with the, but your job is to do this with the minimum distance. Now distance. Is, is, is defined in a strange way. It's not the distance in a Euclidean measure. Instead, it's given by this strange looking formula. And uh, we'll, we'll revisit this, the way this is defined uh, because there's something pretty strange about it. Okay, so what is Euclidean distance? How is this different from Euclidean? What would you see in Euclidean distance? Instead of comma, you would see a plus, and instead of minimum, you'd see a square root, right? Yes? Okay. And what you want as output is the length of the, of the shortest hopscotch, hopscotch path. Yeah? 
And the constraints here are nasty. You're told that n can be as big as 500. And that's pretty large. Uh, and of course, k can be any, any number, but, it's, but it, it cannot be more than n squared because there are only n squared possible sets. All right, and you're told that, what are you told? Will the path always exist? Oh, minus one if no such path exists. So it's possible that the path doesn't exist. And if so, you have to report minus one. And what are the conditions under which a path may not exist? It's possible that some number is missing, right? Uh, or it's, uh, what else is possible? Well, if all the numbers are there, between 1 and k, you will always have a path. So the only way that something is not possible is if a number is missing. Okay, so if one of the numbers between 1 and k is missing, you can stop immediately and not bother searching for it. Okay, good? Okay, so what do we do? Let's first look for a naive approach, right? That's what we usually do. Uh, so the naive approach says I have, I have n squared cells. It's a grid of n by n, so there are n squared cells. I can again build a graph because what I want to look for is some path. So let's build a graph. And this graph can connect vertices that are labeled i to a vertex that's labeled i plus 1. As long as you do this consistently, all you have to do is to find the path from some start vertex to some end vertex. Now what is that start vertex and end vertex? It's usually better to, to declare a, to create a new start vertex and a new end vertex where the start vertex connects to everything that's labeled one and the end vertex, all the vertices that are labeled k is connected to the end vertex, okay? Um, so you can build a graph and then it's just a matter of finding the shortest path because every edge has a distance. We know the distance measure, so we can compute that distance. And so it's fairly straightforward if, uh, in terms of solving this problem, as long as you know how to build a graph and as long as you know what, how, how to do shortest path. And you, and you do the distance calculations. So the, uh, so the edge weights are the distance. You add a start vertex and an end vertex. And your job is to, is to go from the start vertex to the end vertex with the shortest path. Right? This is the standard approach. Uh, this can take up to n to the fourth time. Why is that? Well, first of all, you have n squared vertices because there are n squared cells. And in the worst case, you have very few numbers. So maybe half the vertices are labeled one and half the vertices are labeled two. And your graph now will have n to the fourth vertices, so, sorry, edges, right? That's too many because 500 to the power four is, is, is getting to be borderline uh, 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 not possible, right? Uh, that would be 10 to the eight times 600. Uh, that sounds like something you should not be touching, right? So we have to, we have to somehow improve on this n to the fourth. And that's where the problem is. So any thoughts on this? What approach would you try? Would you try DP? Or would, since graph is not working out, when do you try dynamic programming? Sorry? What kind of problems do you use DP for? which is similar to what she said, but the first condition of dynamic programming, what kind of problems do you use it for? Related subproblems. Sorry? Related subproblems. Related subproblems. Uh, overlapping. overlapping related subproblems. Related 
when there is a recurrence relation. You're still missing one key point. Sorry, past. Past decision to future decision, that too, but there's still one, one point that's missing. Sorry? A topological order helps you to reduce these such the choices, so they're all, you're all saying uh, useful connected things, but the important point is? In this one, you're stupid. <laughs> 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 Maximization or minimization, that's the key. That's when you, your, your light bulb should go on and you should say, oh yeah, most likely dynamic programming, okay? So Dijkstra's algorithm, which finds the shortest path between vertices, is really a dynamic programming solution, okay? Uh, uh, so anytime you see a minimum or a maximum that's needed, there's a decent chance it's dynamic programming. That's if the greedy algorithm doesn't work, okay? So whenever greedy fails and you're still trying to maximize or minimize, it's gotta be DP, all right? So, so this is most likely a deep dynamic programming approach that should work. The question is how do we, how do we set this up, right? Uh, so assuming that that is so, here's a possible approach that uh, what I could do is I could say, hey, uh, I know that hopscotch, I always go from, from tile i to tile i plus one. What if I only search i plus one labeled uh, uh, grid squares when I'm on, on label I, find the one that's closest or something like that, maybe it should work. So I always go to one uh, and then I find the nearest number two and I find the nearest number three and so on and so forth. Why is this not a good idea or what, do you think it's a good idea? The nearest? Yeah. That's right, so, so taking the nearest at any given time may end, you end, uh, may end up taking you in some direction of the, of the grid that's going to become far away from later things that you might need. So clearly, you could get pushed in directions where you, it, it could be a bad decision later on and you would never know until it really hits you. So this is exactly where dynamic programming, as we know, kind of helps and you have lots of choices, and all the things that you guys said is true, uh, uh, but it helps to know that you are, you're maximizing or minimizing something because that will help you to pare down many of the choices, okay? So, so that's where, that's where this, this is going. So what if I were to do something like this? In iteration i, I only look for labels i plus one. Okay, I don't have to go to the nearest one. Maybe I could try multiple choices. Could this be a good idea? Or why would this be a bad idea? Yeah? If you're trying, let's say again, that the initial problem is that half of them are one. Right, exactly. Half of them are two, you're getting the same issue. That's right. So what if half of them are numbered i, or almost half of them are numbered i, and almost half are numbered i plus one? So that means that roughly half of n squared is labeled i, and half of the other half is labeled i plus one, and I just have to try all these possibilities. It's just gonna drive me nuts, okay? So the number of possibilities becomes too large, and it's exactly the same reason I said earlier, uh, and so your n to the fourth, again, will come to haunt you. So therefore, you have to do something slightly different. Uh, any thoughts on this? What should I try next? I know it sounds like DP. I know it sounds like something along these lines, but I don't know what. <coughs> so it turns out, oops, I messed up here, sorry. Uh, yeah, my slide is messed up. Here's the, there are some key observations that you need in order to make this to work. Uh, 
And if you try out the example that's given to you in the, in the sheet, then it will really help you a lot. So let's go to the, this example and then come back here. Um, Is it this one? No. Yeah, let's look at this example here. In fact, let's look at that first example. It's a 10 by 10 matrix, and you're told that the tiles are numbered 1 through 5. And it yet it says that the total distance is 0. Is it saying it's not possible, or is it saying that the distance is 0? Sorry? The distance is zero. And why is the distance zero? zero from the one to the two in the second row to the two in the second row. So if you look over there, it doesn't matter which one you almost which one you start. Let's say I start here because I can reach it. From one I can go to two to three to four to five. As long as I'm in the same row, my distance covered is zero. And that's because of the strange formula that we had. The strange formula said minimum of xi minus uh, uh, x1 minus x2 whole squared or y1 minus y2 whole squared. So if the difference in x is only 0, if it's in the same row or if it's in the same column, the distance is going to be 0. And this is very critical. What this means is that for any vertex, all these guys in the same column or the same row are at distance 0, so you should be happy to jump there with no, with no cost. Now, this also means something more. It says that, where is distance one? So it's actually one row down and one row up. So in fact, it doesn't include that point. So everything here and everything here almost looks like a mustache. And that, all that's distance one, right? Where's distance two? Same thing, right? It should, it's gonna look something like that. That's all distance two from here. Is that clear? Why, because Everything here has a y distance of 2. Everything here has a x distance of 2. And those are going to be smaller than all the other distances. So therefore, over here, the distance is 0. And so we're going to use this fact very nicely because here's what we're going to do. And it's a little bit complicated. And I, since I don't have time, I'm going to really make this fast. What we'll do is the following. Uh, by the way, over here, the second example seems a little more complicated, and the distance here is 19, which means it's non-trivial, and, and we can figure this out. So here's what we do. Uh, instead of uh, building a graph on the nodes, we're going to build a data structure on the labels. OK? So what I'll do is I'll take label 1 and find all the places where it's located. Take label two, find all the places where it's located. Take label three, find all the places where it's located. So this way I would have cataloged all my labels, and I would know their distance, their, their locations. Now, let's say I start somewhere. I start somewhere. Let's say I start at, at one of the tiles one. How do I find the, find the possible location twos or the distances to all the locations as quickly as possible, uh, or, or at least the nearest ones? Since I'm never going to visit two again, it doesn't matter which one I pick. Uh, uh, so. So what I'm going to do is, the remember, I'm, I'm building a separate data structure for each label. 
Okay, here are. Uh, this is a data structure that's all the grid squares with label i. In fact, I'm going to build two data structures for label i. This is going to be all their x-coordinates, and this is going to be all their y-coordinates. This will help me because I will know, uh, let's say I'm at, I'm at some location, a comma b. I will use A to figure out the nearest, uh, uh, nearest, uh, and let's say that I'm in, I'm on, I'm on, uh, on a grid square that's labeled I minus one. So my next thing should be I. I can look for all the squares that are labeled I. Look at their x coordinates and find the closest. The same thing over here. I would, I would find the y values that are closest and, and then use this information to, to locate where I want to go next. Uh, I won't exactly know where I want to go next. Instead, I then have to turn it around into DP where I say for each square, what is the least distance I'm going to spend in order to get there. All right, so I'm, I'm going to build a third data structure. Remember, I, I build these for every possible value of i, which will help me to find the distances quickly. On top of it, I'm going to build a data structure that says uh, for each of the square entries, so here is a comma b, uh, uh, I will, and let's say this is labeled, I don't know, i. Uh, I can also write down here what is the least distance I, ex I, I spend in order to get there. So uh, effectively what I'm going to do is in order to get to i, I will find the, the, the square that's labeled i minus 1 and add to it that distance and see which one gets me here fastest. And as I process these, uh, the next label, I would have figured out these values and I would update them. I, I know I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going very fast, but we'll, we'll try and work out some of the details here. Uh, but I think the two key things here are, are to have a, first of all, dynamic programming is necessary. The second is some data structure that keeps track of labels and where, they're, where they are to be found, what, what x coordinate and what y coordinates they are to be found. Because I'm separating out their x coordinates and the y coordinates, I can quickly find something over here or over here, depending on whether its x coordinate is closer or y coordinate is closer. In order to find the distance between two things, I have to look at the difference in x or the difference in y, and whichever is smaller, that's, my, that's the right number. If it's closest over here or over here, that's, those are, those are going to be close. So in order to find the things that are closest to A, B, I'll find anything that's on A, that's the closest. Anything here on, on B, that's, that's going to be the closest. Otherwise, I'll look for A plus 1 or A minus 1. That's going to be the next closest. Or B plus 1 or B minus 1 over here, that's going to be the next closest, and so on and so forth. And these are easy to find if your data structure is well organized, which is in this case simply a, a balanced binary data structure. Okay, so some heavy data structures here and some dynamic programming. I don't think this is an easy problem, but anyways, it's it's uh, it it helps to to structure your thinking on this and and then look at it. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Any questions? <coughs> How many people solve this problem? Well, I tried it and I really got somewhere. Yeah. But I still couldn't get past the, the time limit exceeded on an issue I had. Yeah. I uh, ended up looking at the solution and um, I understood it. I know what they're saying, but the key assumption I forgot was how you drew the that mustard thing. <laughs> that, that part I missed and because of that I wasn't able to get the, that final part. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I think that's, that's where the key is. And so using that information, you can organize your data structures nicely and then do your search appropriately. Uh, yeah, not all the pieces are there, but we can probably try and figure this out next time or you guys can, can figure it out over the weekend. Sorry? Two people solved it. Oh yeah? yeah, okay, okay. That's very small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a hard problem, but it's, I still think it's, it's doable, it's, it seems manageable. Uh, th they're not using some you know, Diophantine equations or some, some nasty stuff like this. It's, it's fairly straight, uh, straightforward data structures. It just has to be organized differently. I'll think about it more. Thank you, guys.